Well, I, I remember when I was uh, first married, one of the things that kind of struck me about that time, I, I, one of the scariest things was that I started to realize that I was kind of selfish. Uh, I know, me, right? <laughs> I was the last person that I would think would be selfish. Right. I, it was painful. I, I didn't like to find out about that. And it wasn't just because, just to be clear, it wasn't because my wife was telling me that. It was because maybe there would be moments where I would notice that she was doing something that was selfless. And I thought, oh, that was kind of nice. I should probably do things like that. Or I would catch myself choosing my own comfort rather than serving or loving her. And to come before that mirror... And to see what was there was a little bit scary. But we are going to learn a bit about being selfish in our passage today. So I would like to have Kelly, you can come up and you can read our passage for today. Let me get you. Let me get you. <clears throat> yes. Hi. Kelly Eiblings, um, my family and I have been in CNE for about 15 years, and we just found you. So we're really excited to be here. <laughs> so this is a great community. We love it. Um, so we'll stick around. Okay, this is Hebrews 13. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, and never will I forsake you. You have to be spit again. One of the themes that we're going to get at is that it, we can be people who are selfish. And I wonder if you have come to the point where you have started to recognize that a bit in yourself. Maybe it's not because you have been stealing or having or cutting a line in front of people. I don't know. Maybe it is those things, right? But uh, uh, it could be something like, hey, we always want to get our way. Or we, just, um, we are just kind of cold toward other people's needs or wants. So selfishness means that. It means being more concerned with our needs than the well-being of other people. And we are all, to some degree or another, a bit selfish. Uh, we, of course, are supposed to take care of ourselves, supposed to love other people like we love ourselves. You could say it took me, Kurt, yeah, come on. But sometimes we do that at the expense of ever thinking about the well-being of other people. Uh, and so when we realize that, we go, gosh, I, I should probably recognize when I act that way. And I, I don't like to think about those things. But here's the thing. The people in your life who like you the most, so your family, your friends, God, those people, they want us to recognize the places where we are a bit selfish. Uh, they, these people, because being selfish in the end is kind of like being, uh, a, you ever had a plant that gets bound up in itself? Just kind of wraps its, all of its roots around. And the people who love us are the ones who go, I want to help you in this. And it isn't very fun for the plant, I would guess, when it gets pulled out of the pot and you have to tease out all of the roots. But the idea is that there will be real flourishing for that plant only if it isn't bound up in itself. It's in this pot-bound pot bound plant. Uh, so the people who are invested in us, who like us, will be people who want us to realize that we are sometimes a bit selfish. It is in all of us. And, and Recognizing that it is not unique to Christianity, I don't think. I'll, I think this, you can find plenty of self-help books out there about that. But the Christian message is for us, though, that God loves us ever before we take a step to get unbound. 
that God is the one who has loved us first. And because God likes you, he wants to have his love work in you to, to press down into your lives to, so that it will come out in many, many different ways. That, it, that this God is the gardener who breaks up our root-bound roots. It's uncomfortable, but it's for our good. And, and that's a helpful framework as we hear some of these final instructions as we come to the end of the book of Hebrews that are, in part, a reminder for us not to be selfish. Uh, they, this is not a list of ways to earn God's love. Throughout the book of Hebrews, we have seen that, that God gave his life for us, that he's the one who took the initiative with us, and that life in this kingdom of God is, is marked by God's own self-sacrificial love, self-giving love. And so God's, God is on our side as he's trying to press us out of some unhelpful habits or frame of mind. And so we're being pushed toward that at the end of the book of Hebrews. So it's, it, it doesn't depend on us and what we do. It depends on God. The saving initiative is on his side. But at the end of the book, he's, it, he says, hey, I, I know it's not strange that normal people have certain selfish tendencies. And so the preacher, at the end of this, he gives some practical challenges, like in a lot of other New Testament books. And uh, it's, it is a bit like how I remember my mom when I was leaving the house uh, she had already, I already know that she loves me, but she would also give me a few reminders before she'd leave. Don't forget to do this thing and that thing. Um, that's a bit about what the preacher is doing, giving a few things at the end of the book. So in our passage today, we're going to see that this self-sacrificial, self-giving nature of the kingdom of God is going to be applied to five different heart concerns of a Christian uh, these are not the only things that we care about as Christians, but they are important for us in our interpersonal life and as we interact with the world. So I'm going to divide these things into a couple of different moves, and I see them as really kind of Christian values that we can have. There are going to be three that are more centered on generosity, and two that are going to be a bit more centered on contentment. And there's overlap, of course, all that stuff, whatever. Uh, we can get into it. All right, so the sacrificial, self-giving love of God manifests itself in three different things. Uh, for us to have a generous heart, for us to have a generous home, and for us to be generous to the hurting. So first of all, the generous heart. It says, verse 13, 1. So I'm in chapter 13 of Hebrews, if you didn't get that, chapter 13. In the beginning it says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. So right from the start, we see this is not going to be really easy. <laughs> we, know, we, know, we know who some of those one. It's our fellow believers, and, they, and we, they, I will say different people provide differing levels of difficulty in loving uh, them, to keep on loving. But we're encouraged to keep on loving each other. I love the ongoing nature of that, that there's a, an element where we're pressed to do that. There's this ongoing demonstration of love that needs to happen. And when we do it, it is good and pleasant. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it, it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. Uh, but we, we know it's not just a feeling that we'll have for people, it's costly. It, it demands that we're willing to use our resources and our attention to care for one another, whether it's, I don't know, financially or emotionally, the use of our time. And the, the Apostle John, he emphasized that. He wrote this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So there, there's, a, there's a, a generosity of heart that I see in this. It, it, gosh, if we don't have any pity on other people, how can God's love be in us? It's supposed to overflow, and it, and it looks like it's kind of costly for us to keep on loving each other. And it, I, I think it's going to demand us to lean on God's own generous heart for us to do that. I, at least one practical way, I will say, for us to keep on loving each other, uh, I think 
in a church like this, we are guaranteed to not always agree with each other politically, right? We don't, we don't agree with everybody every, theologically, always. But what I'm asking for us to do is to, to keep on loving each other is going to be for us to try to be gracious with one another in our words, in the way that we care for one another. Especially, you know, it's a little bit quieter right now, I suppose. Uh, I don't know, some people getting worked up over certain measures. But really, we're coming into another election cycle. It's going to, and we are going to need to care for one another well. I think we, we need to already commit and say, what, what does it mean for us as Christians to actually be a little different than the world? Now, if we mirror everything that's happening in the world, what difference is there? Do we not serve a God who gave himself for us? And should we not then lay down our lives for each other to have a generous heart to love one another well, even in our differences? I think that's going to be hard, and it's going to, be, it's going to require us to, to, try, to pray and to live very differently than the world. And to keep on doing that, uh, to keep on having that generous heart, it implies that it's not easy. It m- implies that it's kind of hard, and we're going to have to do it sometimes when you don't feel like it. But we should have a generous heart. It says that we should also have a generous home. This is crazy. Verse 2, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. I think the hospitality to angels bit is a reference to Genesis. If you know the, the story of Abraham who had welcomed three people who had come by and he offered for his wife to make bread for them. Uh, and uh, they stayed and they ended up that they were angels who had come uh, to visit him. But hospitality is a bit, uh, it's, a bit it's a much bigger value in biblical culture. Uh, a much bigger value in the ancient world and in a lot of the rest of the world. I always thought I was pretty hospitable before because I would oftentimes offer a glass of water to my guests. <laughs> then I went to the Middle East and I found out what hospitality really looks like. I, I will tell you, if I think, I, I would challenge, challenge you if you ever tried this, if you're ever in the Middle East, you can, I can almost guarantee if you just knocked on a stranger's door and asked for a cup of coffee, you would get it. Uh, if you just walked up to some random person, knock, 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 excuse me, hey, you know, can I, have a, can I come in and have a cup of coffee? Yes, please, come. Yeah. Uh, you would get it. I, what, what do you think you would get if you knocked on somebody who you don't know's door here in town? <laughs> they like, they check the ring first, and they're like, no, no this guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it says, we're supposed to offer hospitality to strangers. And, we, and what I think about that is, it, it, there's, an element, there's a movement of my heart to care for people that I don't know yet. My, my heart as a Christian should be, could lean toward having some generosity of heart to people who I don't know yet. It's easy for us, in some ways, to care for people we do know. Well, in the last verse, we said we have to keep on loving the people we do know. Keep on loving the ones that you do know, and now have, an, have some more love for the people you don't know yet. Uh, I, this, uh, this is, is going to be a stretch for us, I think. It's something that we as Christians could learn from other cultures, I think. It would be helpful for us. I am not advocating that you start opening your couch to all random passers-by. Um, I don't think that's necessarily helpful in our day and age. Um, but we can think about being friendly to strangers. What does it mean for us to begin to open our homes a bit? And I, I'll tell you what, you know what? I, I used to have more people over to my house before COVID. I, I don't know if you, ha- if you have experienced this. There's a little bit of an element where I just kind of got out of the habit of some things. And it's not because I don't want that. Well, a little bit. I'm like, do I want that now? Like, and I, I need to stretch my heart to say, I, I, want, I want to want to have people over. And I, I like people, so I want to have my home actually begin to be a place where people can meet and to care for us. I, I, I got to say, I, I appreciate something about um, Dave and uh, Michelle Rodriguez. They're actually moving to Tennessee soon, but they, and one thing that they always have, they kind of have an open policy. If they have a party at their house, they, anybody else can join along. And I appreciate that, that leaning of the heart to say, let's have people be a part of it. Maybe you could think about inviting somebody over for a meal. It might be a stretch for you. It might, might be new, but to have our home be a place. What about, this is your church home for many of you. 
if you're not just visiting today, this is your church home. What would it mean for us to be welcoming to people who we don't know yet, who, aren't, who are strangers to us? Maybe it means breaking out of our circle or even inviting some of those people to a meal. What does it mean for us in our life as well? It's, it's hard, especially, boy, I think some of us don't feel like we even keep up with the friends we've got. We feel like, I don't know if I even have space for new people, but there's, a, there's an element of hospitality that if our, if our heart is open, if our, if our home in our heart is open to even begin to have a few new friends to let some people in. So as Christians, we should have a generous heart and we should have a generous home. Boy, both of those are going to stretch me for a long time. I, I need to think more about it, but we've got to roll on. We need to be generous as well to the hurting. The, the writer here is listing off things, and we've got to go through them. Verse 3, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. Boy, how much would you think about people in prison if you were one of them? <laughs> right? And, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So we're thinking about these people in prison, those who are mistreated as if we are. It is a lot easier for me to think about things when it's happening to me. That's true. It, I, all of a sudden, that is a big issue for me to think about whatever that is. Uh, if uh, whatever the, the thing is that you're going through, we automatically think that way. But there's a stretching of our heart to say we can think about other people who are hurting Maybe in a way that we aren't. So when we're not grieving, we can think about somebody who is. When we're not hurting, if our body doesn't hurt right now, we can think about somebody who is. Or maybe when your part is hurting, you can think about somebody who has a different hurting part. Uh, so we can think about those things. And, and prison at the time was that these believ believers were, were being persecuted for their faith and were put in prison for that. Um, there are Christians being mistreated. They're feeling powerless. And it, it uses that word sympathy. It means to feel with somebody. Feel with. As if you yourselves were suffering. I think, the, the word that I thought of, I thought, you know, it would be great for us to have a little bit of imaginative sympathy. It's easy for me to have sympathy when I am going through that thing. But I can, I can imagine what it's like. For me, I can, I can have some imaginative sympathy to put myself in that person's place, even when I'm not suffering. And, and it has this very broad thing as well. So the, the Christians who were in jail, if they were put in jail at that time in the Roman world, there, it wasn't free meals. It wasn't uh, that you were cared for. Actually, oftentimes the people who were in jail needed to rely on friends even for their basic needs, to give them food, to give them what they needed, to give them clothing. But it, it, they even make it much broader to care for those who are mistreated. So I think that it definitely implies that we could be people who care about Christians who are being mistreated or imprisoned in the world. Uh, I, we have on several occasions prayed uh, to think about the organization Open Doors, which is caring for believers who are being persecuted. Uh, I, th I think when we think about people who are being mistreated, boy, that is... Uh, basis for us that could really expand our hearts to a lot of different things. And I know there are a lot of Christians who care about many different things, and this is a terrific rationale for that, for us to, to care about people who are marginalized. As they're being mistreated, what would it be like for me to be in your place? Uh, what does it mean for us to care for people, for babies who aren't born yet? Put myself in their place. Or uh, caring for women in crisis, put myself in their place. Uh, people experiencing racism, what does it mean for me to put myself in their place? People who are mistreated uh, for, uh, there's a lot more, but I wonder what it would mean for us to have a heart of generosity toward people who are hurting. That would that be something that we as Christians would actually look a little different than just the average person on the street to say, you know what, I wouldn't naturally care about this, but I know that Jesus had a heart for me. And Christian people have a heart for the hurting. And I don't always want to do it, but I'm going to try to figure out how to do it. So we have this generous heart, generous home, and we're generous to the hurting. Then what follows is two different bits that seem that they tend to be more sacrificial. That this that sacrificial, self-giving love of God would drive us to be people who are also content 
And I see that in boundaries that God has given us in sexuality and in money. So we have contentment in the area of sexuality. It says in verse 4, Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Uh, I, I'll say some people divide this passage into, uh, I've divided it into for us to be hospitable and content or, uh, or generous and content. But uh, some people will divide it more on the lines of something that's more public and something that's more private. But what's interesting in this discussion, even about sexuality, it is a private thing, but it's discussed in a public way, like that this is something that should be honored by people and that we should be helping each other out. It seems like it's discussed in kind of a public way, that, that we as a community would be committed to seeing that people who are married are thriving, people who are uh, single are, are thriving. Uh, I will say, sometimes Christians are accused, uh, oftentimes rightly, I think, for focusing a bit too much on this particular issue. Uh, but you can see in our passage, this is actually discussed as a whole litany of different things. It's discussed along with how hospitable we are, or how we're using our money. It's uh, all these different ways that we can honor God. Uh, we can be doing that in the area of, of our money or how we care for people who are being mistreated. Uh, and, but uh, this topic is bound to stand out in the 21st century. Both of these, I would say, uh, both sex and money in the world today are things that are, uh, we have a very different view on in the 21st century. It's going to stand out if our Christian view of these things is different than those. Uh, but, boy, it, it was necessary even at this time for them to talk about it. Because the Christian view of our human condition is that we tend to, or that we are tempted to distort many of the good gifts that God gives us. And we do that for everything. We misuse power. We, power can be good. Money can be used in wonderful ways, but we tend to use it in twisted or broken ways. We, as human beings, also tend to misuse God's creation of sexuality and distort it in our lives. And this isn't new, like I say, to this. The writer of Hebrews calls out different groups. He says, hey, let's not be adulterous. That has to do with breaking marriage vows. So if, if somebody in this sexual relationship is married, one or the other or both, uh, or if you're not married, he says, and all, and all the sexually immoral, uh, this word sexual immorality, is, it's going to relate to everything else. Um, it's the word in Greek, porneia, which means basically fornication, sex outside of marriage, uh, People acting like they're married when they're not actually married is the idea of that, uh, that God designed things uh, for a man and a woman together uh, and doing it in a different way. That close physical relationship is supposed to be for married people only. Uh, I, I did call this contentment in the area of sexuality. Uh, I think it's important because I feel like this teaching really is closely tied with the bit about money, uh, where he says that, that whether... I think he's going to say that we can be content with money, but I think that the idea for us is whether we are married or single, that we can demonstrate confidence in God in the area of our sexuality as well. And we don't have time to develop a whole thing on human sexuality, but I can say a few things about this. Like I said, each of us tends to misuse the creation of sexuality and distort its role in our lives. And it manifests itself in many, many different ways. The covenant position on this is faithfulness in heterosexual marriage and celibacy in singleness. These constitute the Christian standard. I love that that little bit is a part of it. And, and it, all of that flows from what Jesus taught as well, that, that we, should be, um, we should be people who are challenged as believers to be faithful in our marriage and to abstain in singleness. And I think all of that is part of this new life in Christ that we lean into. And I got to tell you, that's not a real easy teaching, not in our world today. And it was hard for people who heard it in the first centuries, I think. Uh, but I don't think we need to hear it as if God is discounting our feelings, uh, that, that we would have some desire or feelings with it. They're not, they're not discounted, but it's supposed to be controlled in some way by faith. Just like all the other things in this list, you may not feel like you want to keep on loving people in the community. It doesn't matter how you feel. 
We should be controlled by faith. If we have to be encouraged to be generous, I think we have to also be encouraged to think that our natural disposition of our heart isn't going to be leaning toward God. Uh, but we want, we, don't, we want to help people to flourish. And I think that um, these two areas in our sexuality and with money, we have to be encouraged together to be content, to, um, to say, hey, God, God is in control in these areas, and I'm a fallen creature, uh, and, but it's, and it's going to touch every area of my life, including my sexuality. Uh, and I think we can say as well that this message will run counter to our culture that to say that, that actually that, that our sexuality or sex is not necessary for a full and complete life. It's somebody who is single is definitely not in any way uh, inferior or and somebody who's married or in, well, either way, you're not single. If you're single, you're not inferior or superior to being married. Uh, and he says the marriage, marriage should be honored by all. And I, I don't think that we should take that in any way to think that it's better. Um, it does mean that we as a community, though, are trying to create a culture where people thrive in their lives. And I got to tell you, it is hard to be married. So we care about marriages that aren't ours. We care about those. It is hard to be single. And so we care about singleness that isn't ours. So we together, I, I, I just think it's a picture of a community that's really trying to help each other out. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. So we can seek to honor God in all areas of our lives, including our sexuality. And some of the biggest issues in church, I will say, uh, first things that are really going to be coming up is issues of pornography and uh, how we deal with that. Boy, it's a huge issue in the world, and access is, is way too easy. And it isn't just an issue for the kids. Uh, there is a lack of commitment even in our church to seeing that other marriages are thriving. Uh, or do we care? Do we care if Kurt loves Karen well? More than just like that would like mess up the church or something. <laughs> but do you care for us individually? And do we have a tight enough knit community where singleness is actually plausible, where people can live well and be cared for, uh, that we, all of us can be cared for in our relationships but we know that when we fall short, we are invited always to repent, to receive forgiveness of God, and to walk in the way that God has marked out for us. And I'm going to say a bit more about that in a moment. Because, I, you know, we have trouble as well being content with money. We have trouble with this, and we're going to get to a bit more in a minute. He says, hey, don't, we're not supposed to love money. We are supposed to be, have this contentment that is based on the character of God. To not be anxious about our world and what's going to happen, but to be thankful for what we have. Because, he says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Why? Because God said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? So we, we fight for contentment in these areas, uh, and, and we're, even when we're encouraged to be discontent, and it ends up shaping kind of all the rest of the things. If we are content people, if we believe that God is our helper and he's not going to leave us, we don't need to be afraid. We can realize that he's not leaving us alone. So our, I think when we think about our money, we can say, am I, am I more controlled by my fears than by my faith when it comes to my money? That is hard when the, where the rubber hits the road. All right, this is important for us. When we think about this f list of five things, about generosity and contentment, it is likely, I think, that one or more than one of those might stand out to you as a weakness. Now, maybe one of those did stand out for you. If you are somebody who recognizes that you have not been loving brothers and sisters as God would want you to. Or maybe you recognize that you have not been as hospitable, welcoming to others as God would want you to be. Or you recognize that you have not had that kind of imaginative sympathy for somebody else who is suffering or in difficulty. If you are not living into God's plan for sexuality, or if you recognize that your heart is not free from the love of money and you get anxious about it, I have good news. Because 
from the beginning I said that we are called into a life that mirrors the self-giving love of God. That this kingdom of God means sacrificial, self-giving love. And some people might wonder, hey, does that mean then if I don't have these things, then I'm not in God's kingdom, if that's what his kingdom is there. Or maybe God wouldn't want me anyway. Well, I want to tell us, Christ died for people like us. Christ gave his life for people exactly like us. When we fall short, we are invited to repent. We're invited to receive the forgiveness of God and to walk in his way. But we are invited in. Yes, we are inherently selfish people. But we want to be people who are also committed to this amazingly self-giving God. The one who is willing to empty himself. Christ who gave his life for us. The door is not closed to God. God says, yes, I know that things don't always work in your life. In fact, that's why I gave myself for you. That God is saying, I invite you in. I want you to be with me. I want you to seek me and seek my healing. That that it's not very comfortable and God is going to be teasing out our roots and we're being pushed out of our comfort zone. But what's amazing is that we are in this kingdom of God. The, The king that we follow is inviting us to this same kind. This self-sacrificing king is inviting us to mirror his life. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to help us to be people who, who follow all the things throughout the book of Hebrews, to say, you are our high priest. You are the one who gave yourself for us. And we pray that our Christian life will affect our ethics, even if it's hard. God, I pray that we will be people of great, generous heart. That even when we, especially when we know people are not living up to what God wants, that we will have a heart that welcomes and calls people to relationship. God, we, I was welcomed when my life was still a mess, and it still is. God, you welcome me in, and I pray that that, that will drive us to thankfulness to keep our eyes on the king who gave himself for us, and not that we earn our way to you, but that you initiated with us. Amen. And it's in that spirit that we will turn and now celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is a perfect connection 